Welcome to Truth and Lending, America's go-to mortgage and real estate news podcast. The West Coast is on fire and there is smoke in the studio this morning and this time it's not Greg's fault. We're here to put a wet blanket on your good time, so stick around and lean into the pain, as our favorite pal Jerome might say. We're playing the blame game today, August 29th, 2023. The this game. is 2023. This is truth and lending. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> We're recording an hour earlier than we usually are. There's a lot of smoke <laughs> in the room. Oh, man. There are fires like my, all around us. My eyes and my throat just this morning, if it's a little scratchy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've got rain in the forecast, so hopefully mm-hmm. that will dampen the smoke and uh, help the firefighters put out the fires. Yeah. So uh, today is actually kind of a uh, kind of a fun uh, little topic, uh, the blame game. Um, so Matt Graham from uh, MBS Live, our favorite, our absolute favorite, Matt Grab, Matt Grab. Um, <laughs> if you don't get it, go back. wrote a wrote a piece last week called "Everyone You Can Blame for the 2008 Mortgage Meltdown." So today's podcast is inspired by the writings of MBS Live founder and CEO Matt Graham. Um, he has granted us permission to use excerpts from the following co- commentary. Mm-hmm. So these are n- some of our opinions. Maybe some of our opinions <laughs> align. We will insert them always. But we're <laughs> we're going to <laughs> we're going to definitely overanalyze it, um, but also have uh, I, I think a, a good time reflecting what it was like back then and what the differences are now. Yep. So. Please note, this is not intended to be a thoughtful research piece. Those have been done to death, and in many qu- in many cases, quite well. Um, these are just 27 bullet points off the top of my head, Matt's head, on a Friday morning, because I'm always telling people there are 27 things to blame for the GFE, the Great Financial Crisis. In truth, there are many more, but this is a decent start to the list. Did you realize you said GFE? Just, GFC. just always on the good faith estimate, aren't you? I'm still stuck on the good faith estimate. I can't get past it. And the LE, do you know that, uh, random quick fact before we go into this, do you know that I was married on Trid Day? Oh, yeah. and, you know, no, my I wife worked in secondary for 20 years <laughs> at the lock desk. Mm-hmm. So it was just appropriate that two mortgage people got married like, on October go. 3rd, 2015, also known as the reason, the reason I drink. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> Marriage. The reason I drink. I mean, for day. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number one people to blame were the borrowers. They were just greedy. So um, Matt kind of goes into it here, but some just wanted to keep up. They saw the housing as a good investment given all the appreciation, easy loan programs. They wanted the house. Most of them wanted to sell the house before it was even built because their friends just made 100000 without spending a dime. But they didn't realize that it was so unstable. Unsustainable. 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 You know, I would have not made uh, borrowers the number one. Uh, but again, these are not necessarily in chronicle, chronological order, just <laughs> as they came to them. Uh, but that's actually so true, because I remember back in, in 2005, my parents calling me. I was living in Scottsdale, Arizona at the time. And my parents said, you got to move up here. Uh, we just bought two rental houses. We didn't have to put anything down. And man, we're making hand over fist. This is great. Um, we'll even help you. <laughs> this is what's great. <laughs> we'll even help you with your down payment. Oh yeah. It's like, oh, okay, awesome. So I <laughs> moved back up here at the end of 2005. Uh, got you a didn't job. Buy. I didn't buy. Thankfully, <laughs> um, you weren't one of the greedy ones. <laughs> no. Fast forward. Fast forward a couple of years, and uh, unfortunately, those two rentals did foreclose. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Just like many, many other people. Uh, number two, originators. I do agree with this one. In many cases, LOs sold what they were provided from the lenders and what borrowers demanded. In other cases, LOs bordered on or committed outright fraud to slam deals through in a Wild what? West lending environment. This included asking for favors from appraisers, title companies, realtors, and of course, from their investors. And let me just tell you, as a processor, I got to see some things. Mm. I got to see, <laughs> I, I was encouraged to make the phone calls to appraisers. Like, hey, Rena, what, you know, why don't you pick, pick an appraiser? Yeah. Pick an appraiser say, who you I, think will come in at value. Th- I think that's the biggest Oof. difference mm-hmm. is just the, the schmoozing of appraisers and oh, being, yeah. being close with them. And I wasn't in it, but just the conversations I've heard. And the fact that I've only known it as 
Oh, we can't reach out to an appraiser. Like we can't talk to an appraiser. Oh, <laughs> There's yeah. such like, a wall there. That hey, I I'll send you. And, uh, I'll send you and the kids uh, to Hawaii for a couple of weeks. I really need this value. <laughs> I'm I'm not even kidding. That is yeah. so foreign. To hey, hear. there's there's yeah, a yeah. there's a case of Pappy Van Winkle with your name on it. If you're coming in with <laughs> at value, I mean that was, you know, loan officers were taking their realtors on trips, yeah, and mm. all sorts of things. If if you've ever seen uh, the movie The Big <laughs> days Short, up to, days up to the mountain, everything uh-huh. paid for, everything paid for all the time, and that's why there are still some realtors. No offense, Greg, uh, but people who were <laughs> in the industry back then that still expect that kind of treatment from their loan officers Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and from their title companies. And so that's, you know, that whole quid pro quo thing. Um, Yeah, that's gone away. So what were you both doing in 2008? I was going between between jobs because uh, companies were dropping like flies. I was... You were processing at the time? Mm Mm-hmm. I was probably studying social studies. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, number three, appraisers. You couldn't hardly survive the pre-GFC era if you weren't willing to be a bit, a bit fast and loose as an appraiser. Mm, who LO, doesn't like fast and loose? <laughs> LOs and realtors wanted the value, and if you didn't provide it, you were replaced. Appraisers definitely got shafted especially the honorable ones. That's so true. Especially in Oregon. Now, this wasn't always the case that you had to have as much time. Like appraisers were pretty, it was an easier job to get than it is now. Is mm-hmm. the, I guess what I'm trying to say. And now it's a very challenging job it's to get. It's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like 1,500 hours of being an appren- apprentice. Yeah, unpaid apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Number four is realtors. They'd help you buy or sell anything without regard for affordability or the sustainability of price trends. They assured borrowers that prices will only go up. They added pressure on appraisers, just like LOs, and they also pressured LOs. We're just in a little gully. That's that's my favorite part of the movie. I just watched it last night because I was so pumped for this today. I needed some inspiration, and I like to watch it every every few years. If you've not seen The Big Short, you've absolutely got to watch it. In this industry, refresh your memory. Absolutely, (laughs) because we're not that far away from it. Uh, (laughs) Non-retail bank multi-channel lenders. This is uh, this was one of the layers of money between Wall Street and mortgage originators. So think Countrywide or Option One, um, you know, Greenpoint Financial. There were so many of them. Um, so basically these lenders got looser and looser with guidelines and underwriting an attempt to a keep up with the Joneses and B because they, uh, there hadn't been any obvious fallout since prices only ever went up. And I mean, I remember some deals that would go to 120% LTV. Like like we're going to pay you 20% of the purchase price. When I, you know, when you get those emails from non QM, how far off are we sometimes? <laughs> like some of them mm-hmm. are so sketchy. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing is they're no longer packaged with. The, that's what caused the fallout is they were packaging all these subprime loans with a good thirty-year fixed rate, triple A credit rated mm-hmm. loans, mm-hmm. and then they packaged everything up and they called it all triple A credit rated uh, when literally they were absolute garbage. Yeah, and and I do remember if you put someone in an arm back in the day, you get like two or three times the paydays if you put them in a fixed rate. So why would I give you a fixed rate if I can get oh, yeah. two or three times the pay? Like you're getting an adjustable yeah. rate mortgage all day long. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Retail bank lenders number six. Yeah. The history books would have you believe they were innocent. But anyone originating originating loans at the time knows this is far from the from true in most cases. Some of the banks were relatively innocent in that they were merely providing a channel to access loan programs determined by Fannie and Freddie. But most also had Alt A programs with guidelines and pricing design to compete with likes of Countrywide's Fast and Easy program. Oh, I remember Fast and Easy. So I, I actually worked for Countrywide. Oh, yeah, explain uh, what is 2003 that? 2003 and 20, uh, 2004. Mm-hmm. Oh, Fast and Easy. It's exactly Fast and Easy. <laughs> oh, we'll I close a loan in, in, in five someone, days for I you. I had someone say docs out in like less than that. It was, yeah. it was like six hours uh-huh. from a loan application to docs out ready to sign. So fast Whoa. and so easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What could go wrong? What yeah. could go wrong? Uh, Number seven, wholesale subprime lenders. So not banks, not multi-channel lenders that allowed mortgage companies to underwrite their own loans, but some of them kept their loans on their books. Uh, Many of them sold into larger Wall Street entities. 
There was no Lehman Brothers mortgage subprime rate sheet. <laughs> they specialized in low credit scores and bankruptcies, but also very high loan to value ratios. As high as 100% in many, many cases, but... There were 120% loans out there too. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Wild. Mortgage uh, mortgage brokers and mortgage bakers uh, fill up eight and nine. So companies exist exclusively to originate loans that were brokered to wholesale lenders. Took most of the blame. We, we took most of the blame. And I worked for a broker shop. And the thing is, like, you were required to bring in so many points, right? So that was in the day where you charge like one on the front. And then mm. based on the rate that you gave the person was how much you would make on the back as a yield mm -hmm. spread premium. So I was incentivized, to right, to sell you a higher rate or a riskier loan. So uh, an adjustable rate or option arm. I was incentivized more to put you in risk than I was a, just a, you know, giving you the best rate. So people didn't rate shop so back terrible. then. Yeah. Well, it, how could they? It just they? wasn't. It wasn't yeah. like the internet as yeah. widely accessible. And if you didn't bring in, on. yeah, if you didn't bring in three or four points as a mortgage broker back in the day, oh, you got to talk to. And I remember that that you know, loan officers going to the boss's so office sad. like, why, why would you do this? Why would you only bring in two and a half points? That doesn't make any sense. Oh my gosh. How are we supposed to make any money if you're only bringing in two and a half points? Give them the higher rate. Give them the adjustable rate. Come on, jack it up. <laughs> wow. I'm sad that Matt put the underwriters on here. Poor underwriters. <laughs> <laughs> oh no okay R Randy has underwriters were incentivized too absolutely oh, they're really? hard to blame yeah oh, well i'm i'm naive i'm like the, <laughs> underwriters are always the one thrown in the bus uh some held held firm and did the right thing but some turned a blind eye so yeah kind of like appraisers too is you mm -hmm. get to, you got to pick your underwriter back in the day Oh, through wholesaler, oh, you found someone that you liked, <laughs> wow. and they were fast and loose. Nobody cared. They packaged these things up so fast and moved them on to the next one. Like, all right, let's let's, you know, yeah. turn and burn. Did my, they my did they even need them. underwriters back then? Yeah, I mean, you know, there had to be some stop <laughs> gaps, and right? Balances. There had to be some checks and balances. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. My favorite just is I can't picture it walking into an office and seeing physical. Stacks mm -hmm. of all the loans that people are working on. <laughs> like uh, I had Julie Nash in our office, so that she would have you know stacks of files. Oh yeah, next to her desk, up to the up to her desk. <laughs> yeah, as fast as we could do them. As That's literally wild. as fast as we could <laughs> do them. Surrounded by paperwork. It's like you could just see who was busy or not by. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Well, eleven hedge funds. Loose term here too. You don't have to read it verbatim, oh, Greg. I mean, you're a really tough. good reader, but you I'm can not. just summarize. <laughs> I'm not the best reader. Loose term here, too, because many would consider Lehman to be a hedge fund by the time things got out of hand. But this refers specifically to money managers promising their clients big returns. They created demand for riskier and riskier mm. products with higher returns. They help turn yeah. blind eye to the risk when selling these investments to clients. Yeah. When you think about bet. it, yeah, yeah. When you think about it, it's like, man, <laughs> give me my money. Otherwise, I'm going to take it somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Investment banks, Lehman, Bear Stearns, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, Goldman. Uh, they were the first, sorry, the first two are particularly problematic leading to the GFC. So Lehman, for example, bought several subprime and Alt-A lenders without understanding or caring about the inherent risks and in what they were doing in their business. And then they sold the packages of loans, derivatives to hedge funds and others without accounting for said risks. That's what I picture in the big short is mm -hmm. like the, but, and that's like one side of it that we really don't see too much because I, I haven't worked on the back end of, mm -hmm. of sales and servicing. So that's yeah. interesting to think about. I'm actually surprised here. So I'm, I'm surprised this one's so low at number 13 and this just because I just watched the movie last night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how the S and P is still a thing. Standard and standard and poor's. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, you know, Moody's. So these ratings ag agencies would lose business if they didn't give the rating that the banks demanded. I mean, there's so much crooked behavior. I really feel like the banks and investment banks should be number one. Yeah, that's yeah. just my personal opinion. Uh, Alte lenders, uh, technically not much different than subprime, but for example, Alte would let you do some crazy stuff uh, if you didn't have a bankruptcy. Uh, whereas subprime was geared more towards super low credit scores and bankruptcy. These are the lenders that offer programs like 100% loan to value with no proof of assets or income on investment properties. 
I would have bought like I would have bought like five or six, man. Just keep jacking up my income. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Let it rain money. Yeah. Uh, 15 title companies and escrow officers. Many were not part of the problem. Many were often taking part in hurrying borrowers along through signings they didn't understand. Oh, signings were so quick and there neutral was such third, little they're paperwork. They're a neutral third party. They're a no. neutral third party. It's fine. No, the same thing I mean, as appraisers they're, though. It's they're like... schmoozing with them, but they're a neutral third party. No one was neutral back then. <laughs> as, as a loan officer back then, I would want, and I wasn't a loan officer back then, but you know, if you think about it now, it's like, hey, I want fast and easy. Yep. I want you to get them in, get them out. If they ask questions, don't call me. I'm busy on the yacht drinking Mai Tais. Yep. Yeah. I already got him. Yeah. Uh, option arm lenders. We kind of already touched on this. But do you know what an option arm is, <clears throat> Katie? Uh, no, maybe I don't. Oh, it's a pick your payment. It's a, neg- it's a negative pick amortization yeah, loan. Yeah. And many of them would go up to 125% of the original value. So let's say you bought something 80-20. World Savings Banks and Washington Mutual were famous for their option arms. So you'd have like four different payment options. Okay. Uh-huh. So you'd have option one, which would be like, you know, let's say that fully amortized payment was $2,000 a month. Option one would be like a $400 payment. And then the 1600 would just go on the balance. So this month, if you just didn't feel like paying or you couldn't afford it, ah, you just pay 400 bucks. And oh, then, and so then you can go all the way up to 125% of the value of the house. So the, the unpaid amorti- yeah. amortization and interest right. would right. fall on the back end. Yep. Uh, yep. Up to 120. Yep. And, and then you'd I have your interest that. only, you'd have your, um, you'd have your fully amortized payment. And then there was sort of kind of an in-between hybrid. There was sort of a hybrid. Yeah. So there hmm. were multiple different ways and those option arms typically had the biggest, uh, jumps in adjustments. So when things started adjusting in the second quarter of 2007, people that had our option arms are the ones that really, really got screwed. I wow. wonder what the percentages of those loans that got paid, like where every payment was paid or people just stuck with them. Um, what a great sales technique. What a great sales tool. <laughs> what a horrible, horrible loan. <laughs> That's why we don't have neg admin anymore. So interesting. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> uh, 17 talking heads. So many people got on the TV. It's a great band. (laughs) (laughs) So many people got on the television and said everything was going to be fine, even when many of us already understood that wouldn't be the case. While we couldn't make the bigger list of adding categories, we'll just include economists here, too, (laughs) as some of them were cheerleaders for housing policies that arguably... Are okay, just stop, more? Greg. This, uh, one, this one makes me nervous because it feels very Think real. Think Jim Cramer. But it feels mm. very real to current, right? Mm-hmm. We're oh, all just, hey, everything's fine, we're all man. Just we're be- good. We're believing it. There's the there's the information yeah. beha- backed behind it. I mean, there's plenty of other bullet points that make me not nervous. Yeah. But this one is because I think at that time and when you go back and watch the big short, everyone's like, that's not happening. No one's no one's saying that's happening. Yeah, everything's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. The yeah. water's fine. Come on in. So uh, I'm I'm going to sort of just uh, hijack the podcast for just a second on this one. So wait, is that new? <laughs> so so Matt, Matt, one, one of the things I really respect about Matt Graham is I think this number 17, I think this one right here, I think this one really bothers him, right? The people that predict the predictors, right, and the forecasters, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because people like Jim Cramer, people that had the pulpit, right, they had the news audience. They what people did what what those people said, right? Yeah, kind of like a Barry Habib, and I'm yep. not, you know, I'm not May trying 10th. to slander anyone. When May tenth, but doesn't like come. you know, you start seeing all these <laughs> predictions, and you got loyal followers and loyal listeners. Like, I'll just tell people right now, disclaimer: Hey, it's my opinion; it ought to be yours too. <laughs> But at the same time, like, do not follow me blindly off a cliff because if mm-hmm. I go off a cliff, I don't want to be responsible for anyone else yep. going with me. But yeah, these talking heads, big, big deal. Yeah, mm-hmm. makes sense. Uh, Mom and pa investors, too, they create a demand for stuff they just didn't understand. So they're arguably innocent, but also pretty greedy. Mom and pa. Uh, builders, this was really big. So many builders. Uh, Especially in Bend. Yeah, and just from... From my experience, there were a couple of builders that ended their own lives during the crash. It was very sad. Um, but builders, yeah, were, were churning properties. So if you if you had a house built in 2004, 2005, 2006, you might want to tear it down and rebuild it. 
<laughs> we're uh, we're they at were a house slapped that was built in that time. together. Yeah, they were mm. really slapped together, and it was like, man, hey, we can't build these things fast enough, and we got to make money, make money, make money. So, and if speed it wasn't it up, if corners. it wasn't finished, it was left undone for a yeah. while with so, unsealed um, unsealed wood. Oh yeah. wow, yeah, and in a lot of you know a lot of uh, counties and um, municipalities. We're just like, all right, hey, this is great. Let's keep growing our community, slapping <laughs> through. I mean, there's been there's more regulation now on them and building inspectors, but yeah. that was, I mean, it was never unheard of to have a building inspector in your pocket. Yep. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, terrible. it passes. It's fine. Nobody needs a ground wire. Uh, Fanny and Freddie, uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's another one. Fanny and Freddie, you know, they ended up getting bailed out by the federal government. In fact, they mm-hmm. are now government entities. Uh, before they were not, they were they were very even very lightly regulated, um, but they were just literally buying crap. I mean the Fanny the Fannie Mae handbook, which is now I don't know, couple couple yeah. hundred couple thousand pages, it was like a little booklet, like basically just said, do whatever you want. Really? <laughs> I mean, it didn't say do whatever you want, but I'm but just it summarizing. Was, it was that much smaller. <laughs> oh yeah. So what were you underwriting to? Uh, who knows. <laughs> who knows so interesting yeah. number 21 HUD press Fannie and Fetty to buy more crap loans also bought crap loans <laughs> I, th- you know there were not many FHA loans from what I remember everything what else really sub, uh, subprime the, I feel like I always heard about a lot of USDA loans going uh huh no? yeah. yeah yeah decent amount but like you ran into income limits and you had to document that income at least the USDA wasn't what, you doing had to the document crap. Document alone. Yeah, yeah, Whoa. you had to document alone. <laughs> Legislative governments are also on here. So where were you guys before the GFC? Hey, Congress was getting rich too. Everybody was lining their pockets, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, was, they were pushing for looser lending standards and had at least some influence on the affordable housing legislation, but plenty of dead horse beating after the fact. Ooh, executive government. Clinton mm. was a popular president. I did not have relations with that woman. <laughs> You're really good at that. <laughs> but changes to housing policies are argued by some to be paved the way for at least the last three bullet points. So let's not forget about the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, which deregulated the derivatives that ended up playing a key role in the meltdown. So a lot of people wanted to play, blame Bush, but it came before a little bit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Remember, this is not a political show. Not Just not stating the facts. <laughs> Uh, the Fed too uh, was was definitely to blame here. Oh, Alan Greenspan was the <laughs> man. Bring back Greenspan. Is that who, is that what we need right now? Alan Greenspan, <laughs> absolutely fast and loose, <laughs> just printing money like man. Hey, we need more ink. We need more paper. Let's get it on, oh, man. Uh, number twenty five, mortgage insurance companies. Not the baddest actors in the pre GFC, but their total net risk and risk to capital figures were clearly surging in the run up to the GFC. Oh yeah, they wanted to get rich too, yeah, and so we had could. mortgage we had mortgage insurance companies that would come into the office. I mean, so the subprime lenders and the Alte lenders would come in, and they'd you know oh, I miss the swag days. Like they'd come in, <laughs> they'd bring oh hey, what's your favorite bottle of whiskey? They bring you a bottle of whiskey, and they always had the coolest swag. Right. So it's like my desk was, you know, anything from like, you know, option one and countrywide stuff. And then like the really legit swag. Right. And the um, uh, MI companies would do the same thing. MI would just tell you all the reasons why you don't want to do an 80 20 or a 90 10 10. You know, a lot of people forget about the 90 10 10. You put a first, second, and a mm-hmm. third mortgage on the mm-hmm. property, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, man. You want to talk about risk. <laughs> I thought this one was interesting. Mortgage servicers. So they didn't cause the GFC, but they definitely made it worse. So it wasn't uncommon. The the delinquency, waiting for people to not spend or mm-hmm. to not make their payments, and it would take four to five years before they would actually take it back. But then they also, uh, Matt also goes on to say, there was the other side of the coin with robo-signing scandal where the banks foreclosed on homes that were too quickly, and they didn't have the proper documentation for it. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, mortgage servicers, you yeah. did it too. And last, uh, MERS. Does anybody know what MERS is? Mortgage Electronic Recording System. Is that right? Yes. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Wait. Yep. I, d- yep. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> wow. Oh, wrong button. I'm sorry, Greg. I'm a little late on that one. That's but I okay. Want, I really wanted really? to get the. I, I'm really proud of you. So Thank MERS, you. MERS is actually the. Uh, 
uh, they track when a loan gets sold from servicer to servicer. Now, was it in place then? Or I thought it came into place after. Not all loans. Well, no, they they had started doing it okay. because people started transferring, right? The mortgage-backed securities. So servicers were changing hands all the time. And the, there was a huge complaint. And and so you have people who yeah. have been like, I don't want my servicer to change. You know, back in the day, I had like 10 different places to send my payment. I got a late payment because there are a lot of a lot of Americans, you know, yeah, a lot of people foreclosed. A lot of people couldn't afford these. Yeah. A lot of people were still paying their house payments. To the wrong person, too. To the wrong person. Yeah. And then it was being uh, recorded on their credit report. And I mean, you look at some credit reports from back in the day and you try to chase mortgage history. My goodness. I had a conversation <laughs> about this in relation to student loans, uh-huh. student loans that aren't government backed that are being transferred servicers as well right yeah. now. And there's not a way to track them to know where they're going. So same, mm. same kind of situation, right? And if you're, if you're not making payments and they can't track who's supposed to be receiving the payments, then you might just not. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no way to know who to foreclose to or did they get the right documentation to know where to send it to. So it's all this kind of battle. And so it leaves a lot of money up in the air that could just go unaccounted for. So... So I now let's pretty big one. Let's <laughs> let's kind of compare things um, between then and now. Well, loan fraud can <laughs> can touch on it. That's, I mean, loan fraud's coming back. It's coming back, but it's not nearly where it was. It's back not then. near. It's not nearly as fast and as loose. <laughs> yep. People are a little bit more desperate, right? I think people, um, hopefully, in the industry, have a fear of what happened. We've we've all tasted the the blood of it and i think that there's gonna hold more people accountable now than otherwise would have what do you think is different about now versus back then i mean just the guidelines so much has changed just from needing to document income and (laughs) all of this i mean loans seem a lot more safe now just Mm -hmm. from the rigorous things you got to go through to get it now even when you talk to the the clients that don't want to provide things (laughs) Here's, here's where i see the big differences right so back then, there was no increase in people's pay, right? Yeah. Home prices kept going up. Uh, monthly payments kept going up, but people were still getting paid the same. Mm-hmm. So now we have people who have been getting paid more, right? Wages have gone up tremendously over mm-hmm. the last few years. But then you've also got 90 plus percent of America's in a 3% or better mortgage, mm-hmm. right? Those ones are pretty AAA if you ask me. It's the ones that we've originated in the last two years that draw me great concern. Mm -hmm. So while we are not going to see the same collapse that we saw in 2008, it is my personal opinion that we will see default rates continue to rise, especially with student loans. Uh, Student loan interest starts in three days. So uh, good luck, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But that is like serious cause for concern. If you you put down 5% or less in, in the last two years, you are most likely upside down on your house. And your payment is super high. As long as you can keep making your payment, yeah. As long as you can keep making your payment, you're fine. But I, I will, I, I do think we're going to see default rates go up, and we're going to see people who are in these six and seven percent mortgages. That's where the majority of those defaults are going to come from. Yeah, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting if you just look at what ninety five percent LTV and higher, and what the DTI, the average DTI was mm-hmm. on those loans. But that's that's also why we have the qualified mortgage. Right, is mm-hmm. we have to make sure that we vet can they make their payment? What has their stability been like? Mm-hmm. So, you know, back in the day when you didn't get loans denied, now you actually kind of do mm-hmm. because <laughs> banks care because they don't want to they don't want to go through all of that again. So that's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Great work, guys. Yeah. Great, great, great work, fantastic. great work, Matt Graham. Yeah, yeah. seriously, Matt Graham. Thank that, you. That was fun to go through. That Thanks for fun. writing the podcast for it's us a good today. Reminder. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Truth and Lending Mortgage News. Take us away, Greg. Yeah. Our best pal, Jerome, gave oh, us Jerome's more of the same friend. last week in Jackson Hole. Can anyone say rates are data dependent? I like data dependent. Data dependent is okay, but I prefer <laughs> data. Data just sounds so much more, you know. Data dependent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll see uh, what happens. Fannie Mae reports lowest single family serious mortgage delinquency rates since 2002, contradicting Black Knight's report last week that said they were on the rise in July. Where's all this data come from? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we've been saying for our entire career in Truth and Lending podcasts, CNBC reports household debt is at an all time high. But 
2008 was still worse. So there's that. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the, the added bonus. The dollar was worth a little bit more back then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jolts, the job openings, missed the mark this morning by 638,000. That's a big freaking number. Ooh. Last month's wow. numbers were revised down. And Greg, I stole a little bit of your thunder here. That's okay. uh, revised down 417,000 jobs. Why is that so important? Tell me. Tell me why it's so important. We're going to see that those rates improve. Data dependent. Mm, okay, that's not really what I'm going for, but good try. Pay for effort. I'm going to hand this one off to Randy. I would love to hear your Ooh, answer. Oh, back to me. <laughs> Randy with the big news. Um, I I feel like that's the cracks that we're starting to see. We're starting to see some cracks, mm. right? We, we're not going to see a full Humpty Dumpty, you know, but we're starting to see some cracks. Yeah. Wow. So I'm ready for it. Yeah. yeah. Lots of big news to keep an eye on this week. Jolts, NFP, PCE, and unemployment. Yeah, that non-farm payroll and unemployment rate comes out on Friday. That's going to be big. Uh, mm-hmm. PCE comes out tomorrow. Uh, we're having a pretty good day today um, in the market. So if we can end the week green overall, I think that's a win. We're right. still not where we were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a rough week. Uh, a little bit. Banking regulators forced mid-sized regional banks to raise more more long-term debt, not deposits, in the event of failure and government seizure. Why do you think that's important, government Katie? Seizure. Yeah, why do you think that's important? Uh, oh, I have the answer. Of course, of course I'll tell you. you what, I'll tell you why it's important. <laughs> uh, now, I'm no conspiracy theorist, uh, but ultimately, um, regulators want to get ahead of this. They they want to prevent what happened to uh, Silicon Valley Bank happening to these other mid-sized yeah. uh, banks like M T Bank, uh, Regions Bank. Um, there's a handful of others that were. Uh, Moody's had actually downgraded them a couple of weeks ago. Now, in my opinion, and this is my this is my conspiracy theory, okay, is that that long term debt, right? They want them, they don't want them to just cherry pick and, and pick and choose. Hey, this is what you can lend, this is what you can't lend. They want them to start lending on mortgages. So we could see from these regional banks and other banks that will follow suit, we could see a resurgence in construction loans. And banks softening their stance on mortgages because right now the majority of uh, mortgages are coming from uh, mortgage lenders, mortgage banks, uh, mortgage brokers, wholesale outlets, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of banks have kind of dried up and say, yeah, no, we're a little too nervous to be lending out 7%. But the regulators are saying, no, you need to lend out that money because if we end up absorbing you or we let a bigger bank absorb you, you've got to have something on a long-term debt Mm -hmm. balance sheet that's going to pay money, right? That's not going to... So think back in the day, Bank of America was basically forced to buy Countrywide. And Countrywide was one big, giant, negative asset. And Bank of America was forced to buy them. Mm -hmm. So essentially, they're trying to prevent what happened in 2008. But then why are so many regional size and mid-sized banks getting out of mortgage lending? Right. Well, it's because uh, there's, you know, they're having to borrow money. Right now, banks want to borrow money at 0%, right? Which is deposits, right? Mm-hmm. They want to yeah. bring in deposits. They want to borrow it at 0% and then lend it out at 7 8%. That's where they make their money. Yeah. Uh, but they don't want to lend money that they've got hedged elsewhere because banks borrow money from other banks, yeah. right? And they lend money to other banks and they want to make that whole 7%. They don't want to just make 1% or 2%. That doesn't mm-hmm. make any money for them, right? And they've got shareholders. You know, mm-hmm. shareholders kind of run the whole thing. Aww. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Why do you have to make so many people happy? Well, uh, rates <laughs> last week were a disgusting 7.5% for a 30-year fixed. Uh, they've improved quite a bit. In fact, uh, what I've got on my sheet from yesterday at 7.3% is probably a little outdated by the improvement we've seen today. I'm willing to bet we're at seven and a quarter or better, which is fan freaking tastic So... What do we learn today, you guys? Don't do it again. <laughs> Don't do drugs. They're bad. Be nice Don't to people. Don't do drugs bad. Be nice to people. And, and hey, if, if you see a firefighter. There's many to blame. A wildland firefighter, shake their hand. Tell them thank you. Say thank you. Especially on the West Coast, man. We are burning down. Do your rain dance. Yeah, do Ooh. your rain dance. We need it. And, uh, you know, give a, give a shout out to the people in Florida that are about to get a whole year's worth of rain in one weekend so <laughs> i didn't hear that there's two hurricanes going to florida oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know yeah. That. they're gonna meet up and create a super hurricane mm-hmm. yep so good luck florida <laughs> we'll be over here on fire yeah 
<laughs> no doubt. Uh, oh. All right. Only two more episodes left in the season, you guys. Woo. See you later, potato heads.